Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. We don't quite know when you will play this uh, video clip back, but this is the, uh, I think, the fifth in the series, George is Curious. Gavin, it's based on uh, a little children's, uh, I don't know if, if you ever watched uh, Curious George, the curious little monkey. Absolutely did. I'm curious, and I'm curious in this instance about First Peter, and my guest is the Reverend Gavin Locke, the minister of the St. James Presbyterian Church in Bedford View, Johannesburg, and a longtime friend of mine. And I'm so excited to be in, in his company today and to share this study on First Peter chapter 4. Welcome, Gavin. Thank you, George. It's such a privilege to be able to share in this time with you. And uh, we won't reveal to the folk who are watching this that I knew you so long ago that you had a different name, but uh -huh. I won't reveal the secrets to the public. It was like, it was like Saul becoming poor. Oh, is that what it was? <laughs> okay. uh, Gavin, do you know, just out of interest, I, I'm going to throw one at you here. Is the St. James, uh, after whom the uh, congregation is named, the brother of Christ or the disciple of Jesus, the son of Zebedee? It yeah. is the brother of Christ, as far as I know. Okay. The, the one who chaired the council in Jerusalem in Acts 15. That, that's correct. That's okay. Right. Okay. That's interesting. Okay, Gavin, we're looking at First Peter, and we've uh, had a little bit of time, a few weeks, to go over some things. We've discovered that it was Peter, but not only Peter, Peter writing with Silas, uh, also known as a companion of, of Paul, um, and that's why the Greek is so good. And Peter is writing this letter, and we discover it's not just a general letter. It's actually written to a particular audience, and that is people who are living, first-generation Christians, living in the north, uh, west, no, northeast of uh, Turkey, modern-day Turkey. Uh, we've traced those names, and we think it's an early letter, and he's giving some advice, and we're taking it as advice to Christians of a first generation who are trying to work out how to live in a pagan world, a world that doesn't understand their ethics or, or worldview. And, um, and, and, but also, of, obviously, um, it's, it's good advice for us. Now, in the first part of chapter 4, um, Peter is describing a change which happens to Christians. And we're familiar with this because we find it all over the show. Jesus used terms like, uh, when he was speaking to Nicodemus, you need to be born from above or born again. Um, and then uh, Paul talks about a turning around, a metanoia. Um, now, <laughs> this transformation, as far as Peter describes it, in verses two and three is very radical. Mm -hmm. uh, he paints a picture of a people who are giving themselves over to debauchery and drunkenness and things like that. Why does he is describe the pre-Christian life like this? It's a very interesting question, George, and I, I guess one has to put the text in context. Uh, one needs to remember that in those days, a lot of worship that took place was part of a cultic experience that included uh, debaucheness and drunkenness and the like. Uh, there was an adherence to uh, acts that included uh, temple prostitution. Uh, there were great feasts uh, with uh, much feasting, um, food, uh, alcohol, and uh, it really was an act of worship that was quite self-centered and narcissistic. Uh, that was uh, perhaps reminiscent of what we would talk about instant gratification nowadays. Yes. And this was deemed to be um, an act of piousness, of righteousness, where it was uh, something that you went and did as an act of reverence to the God that you were worshiping. Yes. And it would yes. have been a part of the normal everyday experience. And being raised in an environment where that was the norm, I guess uh, to be introduced to a faith that suggested the alternative uh, was more appropriate would be yes. hugely radical. Right. You have to eschew something that was quite, um, quite different. Mm. And so I guess for the Christian of the day, uh, that would have been massive. And it sort of leaves us with the principle, you know, um, perhaps if we have to repent of those experiences nowadays, it speaks to a wildlife uh, that would be interesting to hear about. But yeah. I guess we have to look at the principle in our own lives and ask, um, 
in terms of the principles, what is it we have to turn from? Uh, yeah. What keeps us from an authentic experience of Christ without specifically looking at um, the uh, experiences that they had in those days? So uh, long story short, maybe good to look at the principles of what we need mm -hmm. to turn from as a question right. of those specific events, yeah. And um, so, so Christians would have had to change their everyday behavior. Um, those that, that converted to Christianity in, in the north of, because um, remember in the book of Acts, you know, we, the, 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 the onlookers, the, those that are hearing what's happening in the upper room and are gathering, um, are described as people from some of these very areas that Peter is writing to. Mm. So they might have experienced Christianity for the first time. Um, in the Pentecost experience, they go home and now they've got to adjust their lifestyles because um, they, they're out of sync with everybody else. And one of the interesting things, Gavin, I found in my reading was that the faith of the Romans was not really a religious, effective type of faith. It was a political thing. It was a sense of community and adherence. And so the early Christians, when they stopped going to those fertility uh, cults and the great festivals that involve this sort of behavior, the, the springtime, um, you know, the harvest festival of the grapes and right. everything. When they stop going there, they're marginalizing themselves and they're opening themselves up to persecution because their neighbors say, well, where were you? You know, we were there. We were looking for you. You sat with us last year and, um, and, and now you're no longer there. And one, it's an opportunity for witness, but two, it's also a pulling away from your neighbors. Because they they now saying, but you didn't come, and you're not you know part of it anymore. And I guess when when one is in a group of people, I mean, I'm talking now back in my student years. Well, not quite as harsh as this, but um, when one is part of a group of people, you don't want to seem out. You know, you want to you want to be involved. And now, if you're not there and you're not part of it, and the behaviour that they uh, displayed was was you know iffy, um, they're going to feel embarrassed and shame and shame and honour, of course big thing in, in uh, Middle Eastern culture. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine how difficult it would have been for those Christians to live in a pagan world. I mean, we don't really have those kinds of problems today, do we? Absolutely, George. And, and I think the, uh, this alludes to the suffering that we read about a little later on in, in the same chapter, because the, uh, it, it was more than just a, a social ostracism, because um, this worship obviously it was politically expedient, particularly if you're venerating Caesar, yes. um, but also it was aligned to certain guilds to, um, yes. I suppose, the equivalent of trade unions nowadays. Yes. But if you were a silversmith, you worshipped a particular god, uh, you uh, practiced your trade or your craft in a particular area, um, yes. you uh, cooperated with each other, and if you eschewed that worship, um, if you denied that God, you were also kicked out of that guild. Uh -huh. So you lost your ability to earn an income. Yes. And so there was an economic isolation. Mm -hmm. Of course, there was a social isolation. And of course, um, families, uh, you know, you usually worship together as, as units. Yes. And you could be ostracized from the family as well. Right. And I think when it comes to sin, nowadays we tend to moralize it. Uh, it tends to be a moral issue. Whereas in those days, it was uh, much more pragmatic. Um, it was about the breaking down of relationships. And um, this, this whole uh, debauchery that Peter refers to is, is very much about a breakdown in, in that sort of sacrificial love, that giving, that serving of others, that connecting with others. It yeah. really was self-centered. And um, to walk away from these pagan cults uh, is really to... Uh, walk away from a, a selflessness and to move towards a, um, a unconditional love towards others. Yes. And that kind of whole attitude, uh, which we'll see later on in, in, in the chapter, is quite foreign to, right. to I guess, those acts of worship. So yes. um, overall, the whole experience would have just turned everything on its head. Yes. I'm sure you've heard of the, the phrase homeostasis. Uh, oh, yeah. sort of a, a family a family system where um, families try and seek a balance in everything that they do. Yes. And if someone came into the family and started worshipping uh, differently, not only a different God, 
but in a different way, with a different attitude and a different set of priorities. Mm. Everything would have been turned upside down. Yes. And so the suffering would have been social. It would have been economic. It would have also been psychological. Right. Because everything that was safe would now be um, different. And yes. uh, the position from which people were operating would now be completely different from what it was before. So I think Peter was writing to a group of people for which everything was in crisis. Yes. And I think they were lost because their culture, their values, their worldview was just completely different from what it was before. Right. And so, you know, you and I have the benefit of um, operating in, I'm going to risk poor terminology here, a, a Christian culture or a Christian world where even if we're not practicing believers, are we familiar with the values of our faith? Yeah. Um, but for them, it was so different. And so right. that's why it was such a crisis for them. No, that's and very then, helpful. Yeah. And then if we go on, so Peter, in, in, in his trying to help, he's giving advice uh, to this group of people in that sort of situation. Um, he encourages them in two words that jump out to me. Verse one, you must arm yourselves. That's reminiscent for me of Ephesians 6. And then you must listen. Interesting. And then he calls them to live differently. And I want to try and put this up on the screen here. Um, so, and I'm going to use the message version. And there I've got it on the screen. So basically what, um, what Peter is saying is, and this is from verse 7 to 11. Everything in the world is about to get wrapped up. So that is catalogical thinking. Take nothing for granted. Stay awake in prayer, wide awake in prayer. Love each other as if your life depended on it. Be quick to give a meal to the hungry. Be generous with the different things that God gave you. So, so he, he is giving them um, really very, I mean, it, you, we, we call this ethics, but it's really very practical, isn't it? Mm, absolutely. Um, and it's almost the antithesis of their previous worship experience. Uh, there are a few things here. Uh, it's really about a change in attitude, that arming of yourself, I love that. Um, it, it, as you say, it's reminiscent of Ephesians 6, uh, with uh, where you've got a shield and a, a soldier who's um, preparing themselves for battle, uh, where their defenses are almost up. And, um, and he's really talking about our, our minds, how we've got to have a change of attitude. You'll see it's not only at the beginning in verse 1, but yes. also in verse 7, he talks about being of sober mind. And right. it's almost a sense where Peter is saying, we need to change our attitudes um, from being narcissistic, from engaging in this drunkenness and debauchery and all the rest, um, again, not the specific so much, but the general attitude of serving our own needs to a place where, uh, and I'm going to quote the message you've got here that's beautiful, where you love each other as if your life depended on it. Mm -hmm. And that's the radical change that Peter's talking about, yeah. where our lives shift from being about ourselves to serving others as though our lives depend on it yes. and then he goes on to to give the most beautiful examples be quick to give a meal to the hungry be to the homeless cheerfully uh, be generous with different things um, such a lovely practical way of showing people what it means to live yes. you know i think uh, george you may uh, agree with me i think we tend to super spiritualize things too much you know um, the one verse here where it talks about drunkenness uh, you'll find us being standing in the pulpit and speaking against um, drinking wine, which I guess in Somerset West would be a heinous thing to say, <laughs> surrounded by so many vineyards. But that's not what Peter is saying. Peter is saying um, it's about not serving your own interests. Mm. It's about learning to love, which of course is the great commandment. Yes. And that is the shift that he's talking about here, um, is that in this great suffering that you're experiencing because of this transformation from worshiping in these cults to worshiping Jesus. Yes. The single best thing that you can do is to change your mindset, to guard yourself, to protect yourself by no longer expecting to serve your own interests, but by loving one another as though your life depended on it. Yes. 
Yes, I don't know about you, Gavin, but I found myself tremendously disappointed um, monitoring social media and the newspapers and the, even the, the remarks that have been made after political speeches and so on um, by the selfishness, the sheer selfishness of people. And, the, and it's almost as if this um, coronavirus uh, pandemic and its lockdown and so on has, has brought this to the fore. You know, the, the extent to which, I mean, I enjoy a glass of wine, I love a whiskey and so on, but I mean, the extent to which people are, you know, are absolutely um, beside themselves when they can't buy it, uh, or, or whether it be cigarettes or alcohol or whatever. And, and all of a sudden, you know, because, and, and you know, uh, us white South Africans are being affected, sure, by this thing. But can you imagine the very poor who've lost their jobs and so on? I mean, you can't even put them, yourself into right. their shoes. And yet, Absolutely. the ranting and raving that goes on, uh, mm -hmm. the sheer selfishness of people. And what Peter is talking about here in verses 7 to 11 is an mm -hmm. antithesis of selfishness. It's a generosity. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, to, just to expand on your example, um, you know, you, you go into a, into a shopping mall or into a shop and, and someone's refusing to wear a mask. Um, and, and they will wax lyric about it, um, not comprehending that this is not about them. This is about the people around them. Yes. Um, and keeping the people around them safe. And irrespective of their own views, it's about respect for others. Yes. And it's just that kind of attitude. Um, I'd, mm -hmm. I'd rather uh, push someone over or beat them up to get the last toilet roll for myself than sure. to make sure that someone else is okay. Mm -hmm. So I uh, absolutely echo everything even, that you said. I agree with even you. the the unbelievable selfishness displayed by people who are reluctant to say black lives matter uh, and, yeah. and are insistent upon saying all lives matter. Well, everybody knows all lives matter. But in this instance, when a black man has been killed by a police officer, what, what does it take from you to say black lives matter? Does it take anything away from anything else? I mean, oh, unbelievable. And I just, I'm, I'm so motivated by this beautiful and simple advice that Peter gives which is all about other people, mm. keeping other people safe, as you say. Absolutely, and the fear that if I put someone else first, maybe I will lose something of myself. Yes, yeah. um, which you never do. I mean, I, in another forum, we, I've been talking with Rod Botsis about the prodigal son, and right. uh, Henry Nguyen is, is so beautifully puts it, he is the God who does not compare. He does not love the older son less than the younger son, just differently. Right. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Anyway, uh, the other thing, Gavin, that I've picked up in this passage, um, let me just come out of this uh, text here again. Oh, by the way, there is that beautiful piece there um, in the text which says, why do we do all of this? Well, God's bright presence will be evident in everything. I mean, that's a motivation, isn't it? Absolutely. The sheer bright presence of God can be shown through our meager and simple little actions. Yeah, you know, that's reminiscent for me. I mean, uh, there's just so many parallel verses in Scripture that, that attest to that. Uh, we know that God is love. Um, and the closest thing we can come to echoing God is, of course, to love as he is. Yes. And then, of course, we read that Christ is the light of the world. Mm. And so the only way we can bring light into this darkness is to love as Christ loves. Yes. And what I find really fascinating about um, this chapter in Peter and the previous chapter is um, the only advice that Peter gives um, these followers uh, to, in order to, to cope with this persecution, this suffering, is, is to love and yes. to be gracious to those who persecute him. Mm. And, and perhaps that's the greatest light that we can show you know to challenge the lex talionis the the eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth yes that is no longer like that but right. to show grace in the face of persecution and um you know it makes me think and perhaps i'm digressing here so i apologize okay um, of victor frankl in man's search yes, for meaning yes. where uh, he explores the suffering in the um in the concentration camps in the second yes. world war mm. and uh uh, being a, a psychiatrist, um, he uh, was observing why some people were coping in Auschwitz and some people weren't. And he realized that the folk who were coping in those horrific conditions were the folk who found meaning in their suffering. Yeah. Those were the folk who loved, who cared right. for others, who watched out for them. 
and they were suffering just as much as everyone else was but by being unselfish um, by being a light to others they were experiencing that light for themselves mm -hmm. and um, I think when we when we are unselfish and we bring light then mm -hmm. we discover light for yeah. ourselves so great. as much as the unselfishness helps others I think it helps us too yes great okay now there's another little phenomenon I picked up here as I was moving through this passage and that is something that I picked up before in first Peter and that is the um, the understanding of Peter and perhaps the early church um, that the end of uh, things was imminent, the return of Christ was imminent, um, the end is near, uh, he keeps saying. And when I, when I consulted, um, uh, you know, the Scots uh, commentator, William Barclay, who's one of my go-to people, uh, and sometimes great and sometimes like for the miracles, not so great. Uh, he says, well, there's three options. And I want to test these by you and see what you think. Mm. He says either um, the church was the early church was mistaken. You know, they had made an assumption that the that Christ was going to return, but it didn't happen, and it was a mistake. And as with First Peter, so also with the Thessalonians, it was a mistake. Um, alternatively, um, it's not so much that they um, that it was a mistake they interpreted the death resurrection and ascension of jesus as the end times so they were living in the end times and it's not so much that they were thinking the last judgment is coming right now but they were living in the end times and we are all still living in the end times it's a kind of like a kairos um, mm. you know explanation rather than a chronological explanation or um, finally um, they were living in the assurance that any one of us can die any day, any moment. You know, we can be knocked over by the bus as it comes down the road, and we will then be in the end time. So, so it is imminent, um, and some of us, you know, will be there soon, and others will be there later. But the fact is, um, we're all at the edge of life, and at the beginning of death, and at the beginning of everlasting life. How do you, how do you f figure that out, Gavin? Um, uh, I also consulted the 13th disciple, William Martin. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I guess uh, at the risk of being a post-modernist relativist, um, I, I think all three are, mm. are perhaps a little bit true. Um, I think when one reads the, the New Testament, there's a definite sense that um, particularly those New Testament texts where uh, Paul encourages others to, to work. They mustn't stop working uh, just because they think Jesus is coming again. So yeah. I think there was a real sense that he was coming soon. Yes. And, and um, he, he didn't. He didn't come as soon as they anticipated. Right. I also think that we are living in an age of um, enjoying the benefits and the fruits of the resurrection and the presence of the Holy Spirit, yes. um, where there is a sense where, where that new age has, has obviously materialized, obviously still to be fulfilled. Um, and there is a sense where we may go tomorrow, uh, particularly if you look at all the uh, consp uh, conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, I think there's also a strong psychological phenomenon here. Um, if you look at the suffering that a lot of the early church experienced, uh, they, they needed to hold on to some form of hope. Uh, they needed something to endure. Almost the carrot in front of the donkey, as it will as it were, excuse me. And, um, and that one hope when you've lost your income, perhaps your family or relationships, is, is the idea that Jesus will come again right. and fulfill all these promises and dreams. And we see that at the beginning of Peter, where Peter uh, sort of shifts um, uh, the idea of, of salvation from sort of a temporal um, materialistic blessing into things that don't perish. Uh, okay. the eternal, you know, the grass that fades into something, a salvation that has a longer lasting investment and consequences. Yes. And um, it's an investment in eternal things. Mm -hmm. And almost um, lifting one eyes to, to Christ returning to the end that is near, mm -hmm. um, almost helps one to live in anticipation of that. Right. So again, I think it's all three. But at the same time, I also think it was incentive for the people of the day to keep on keeping on 
to quote yes. a friend of ours, Mark Masango, right. uh, because it was an inspiration to endure the suffering yes. uh, as Jesus endured, which is the example that Peter provides here. Um, right. And if we endure that with love, we experience that light. Mm. Okay, um, well, let's take it on to the next one then. So um, the other, you, you find these um, wonderful uh, unexpected surprises, these serendipities, or at least I do. Um, and in this passage of 1 Peter 4 there, um, Peter uh, highlights for us two of what I think are the, um, the great tasks of the church. And I put on the NIV here, if anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. So um, speaking and serving, and, and really from day one, uh, they have been uh, very important you know, aspects in the church's life. Uh, the very first uh, great sermon after the Pentecost experience was Peter addressing maybe some of the very same people who he was addressing now, those that were coming to the city of Jerusalem, God-fearing people, um, to celebrate the, the um, was it the Feast of Weeks? And then, um, and then, so he was speaking and, he, and people were converted and so on. But then very soon after the organization of the Jerusalem church, we see the introduction of the deacon. And the deacon is the one who's supposed to serve. The apostle's going to do the preaching. The deacon's going to be the one to serve. Very soon we realize this thing's not going to work exactly as, as the early church intended because Stephen is actually preaching. And that's what gets him stoned. Um, but... Um, but preaching and serving, uh, are these still important for us? And, and why doesn't he mention some of the other things, do you think? Mm. I think, again, it's, it's about uh, principles, um, uh, or the principles that, that this particular verse represents. Remember, faith in those times was very anthropomorphic, um, anthropocentric. Mm. Um, you know, you had the Caesar cult, um, you had the, the gods that were very human, um, and that had human natures and, and human desires. And um, the worship served um, human uh, needs in a sense. And there's this massive shift as Peter writes to these Gentiles yes. um, where he's challenging them. And again, this comes to changing the attitude of the minds that we referred to earlier. It all ties in together where um, everything has to shift from oneself to the other, to the holy other, uh, to quote a great theologian where our focus is now on God and not on ourselves. Yes. Our focus is now on the eternal and not on the temporal. And our focus is on investing in love and sacrifice and not on meeting immediate needs and immediate gratification. And so when I'm speaking, I'm serving God. I'm serving God's agenda. I'm serving um, his um, purpose. Yes. And so um, the things that I say will be governed by that agenda, not by my own. Right. And, um, you know, often when we serve, we do it with ulterior motives. I think my greatest complaint about our faith is that it can be very selfish because uh, we're only doing it because we want to get into heaven, which yes. shouldn't be the basis of what of why we believe. We, we right. believe because we desire a relationship with, with the living Christ. Mm -hmm. And I think what this text does and, and this goal of the church is it mediates why and what we do. And right. if this becomes the overarching principle of our belief, yes. it ensures it sort of takes us away from the rules and, and from following a set of rules. That yes. if these become the boundaries, that if we speak with the words of God, as long as our words serve God, yes. um, then they are authentic. And if we act in the strength of God, then our actions will honor Him. Yes. So it takes it from a rule-based faith to one that seeks to build relationship with God and build relationship yes. with, with the other. And invite, uh, invite the other into the relationship with God as well. Beautiful. Um, so Absolutely. we're loving yeah. our neighbor, we're loving our God, but we're also mm -hmm. facilitating a way for our neighbor to meet the God who, who desires the best for us. Um, Absolutely. Gavin, um, the, the next one um, has to do with a fiery ordeal. And uh, I was fascinated by this. Um, you know, it's probably uh, referring to a sort of persecution. But one thing I did pick up 
um, is that the, Peter's words are getting more extreme when it comes to the persecution. Uh, he, he waits until chapter 4, verse 12, to refer to the persecution as a fiery, if it is the persecution he's referring to, as a fiery ordeal. Um, in the NIV, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening. Um, is it persecution? And why has it become a fiery ordeal, do you think? Um, very interesting to, to look at the, the different academic um, proposals regarding the fiery ordeal. You know, there's some debate in terms of when this letter was written, yes. uh, whether it was Peter himself, uh, whether it was later or earlier. Yes. Um, and part of the debate was whether uh, there was a state-sponsored persecution of the Christians. Right. Um, and if it was state-sponsored, uh, it would be much more easier to accept a fiery ordeal was some sort of polemic against the believers. Yes. Uh, what most academics seem to feel is that given the positive comments that are made towards the authorities in the previous chapter, that this wasn't so much an orchestrated persecution, but rather was more a societal rejection at the yes. different lifestyle. Um, and so uh, they struggle to pin it down to a specific event, um, but rather see it as just a whole upheaval, uh, some of which I've mentioned beforehand, mm -hmm. that has just turned the whole world uh, on its head for these believers, um, yes. where they've just got to re reorientate themselves uh, in its entirety. Uh, George, I'm not sure if, if your um, uh, reading has brought up anything specific for you. Mm. Look, um, I agree with you. I think for the most part, um, the, the uh, persecution for those Christians in the north of, um, of Turkey at that time was just what we spoke about earlier. You know, the, the societal marginalization, rejection of the guilds, um, the breakup of the family, especially when it comes to uh, women uh, who became, who converted to Christianity when their husbands were still um, part of the you know pagan apparatus, um, there was of course the um, the event that happened after the the, the fire of Rome, um, and uh, we're not quite sure to what extent that reached the provinces, but certainly in Rome there is a good a good deal of historical evidence that Christians were treated pretty badly. Right. Um, but the reason I think that Nero honed in on them is that they were already a marginalised group, and were an easy target. And he didn't really ruffle anybody's feathers um, when he proceeded against them. Um, and and there's, there's a fair amount of evidence, even in the secular history. And I, I've, I've really enjoyed reading, um, you know, Greco-Roman history. Mm. And uh, in the secular history, there is plenty of evidence that Nero needed to find a soft target because he, um, he himself was considered a possible... Um, you know, cause of the fire of Rome. Uh, the historians feel that he was trying to to gain glory for himself by rebuilding. And of course, you can't rebuild un unless the thing is destroyed. Right. So, um, the, you know, some of the early writers are saying, well, maybe he started the fire and then he needed a soft target. But I don't know whether they would have experienced quite the kind of persecution that the Roman Christians, and those that mm -hmm. were close in, um, you know, experienced being, you know, put into the, um, uh, you know, the, into the ring with uh, wild animals and right. the, the like. I think, I think theirs was just, um, you know, being an easy target um, because they believed this weird and way out thing that was treasonous. It wasn't, I, I, I've been amazed to, to, to read this, the stuff which says this is not religious. This was all about politics. That's right. You know, the, if you were a good Roman, you worshipped Caesar and you held to all those pagan cult, cultural rites, the Vestal Virgins and the, you know, all the, the Pontifex Maximus being the, the chief priest and all that. Uh, now, if you didn't do all of that, then they thought, well, maybe it wasn't so much that you were guilty of blasphemy. You were guilty of sedition. You were guilty of uh, um, treason because you, you were refusing to be part. Sorry, say again. Rome wasn't your priority, that's right. Absolutely. Exactly. You had some other allegiance, and who knows what trouble that would bring with it. Now, the Jews had a bit of a special dispensation. Um, 
there, there were most of the emperors kind of put up with them, um, in, with their monotheistic uh, faith. Uh, there were some, um, you know, Caligula, for an example, that didn't put up with them. And eventually it caused the, the destruction of Jerusalem in 70. But uh, for the most part, for some reason, people were happy to turn a blind eye and say, okay, you carry on, but don't make nonsense, you know, and don't uh, get troublesome. So, yeah, so uh, I'm not quite sure what Peter is talking about here, uh, whether he's trying to maybe put it within the context, the persecution within the context of um, the eschatological language that he's using. So he's saying if, if, if it's going tough now, if you experience hardship, you must realize this is the great tribulation basically is coming and this is par for the course, you know, just grin and bear it. Um, yeah, I, I think, think that's I probably think, the only, uh, I think you the know, you see there. Yeah, mm -hmm. the helpful part of this text is, is where he says, you know, though something strange were happening to you. Yes. Um, I think this verse um, encapsulates just that they, that this, it's so alien to them in yes. their normal experience. Yes. And I think that is the fiery ordeal. He's, uh, you know, earlier on in the chapter, he says, um, you know, sort of guard your mind, be alert, um, yes. arm yourself. Yes. And yes. He's, I think he's just mentally preparing them. Yes, you see, I've got it there. I've got strange. verse seven there as well. Yeah, this. Oh, there you go. That's right. This, this, this world is strange. It's strange. Don't be surprised that it's different. Yes. And, and that's the fiery ordeal. That's the persecution, the suffering that you go through. Right. You know, Gavin, when I read this, it reminded me um, about uh, something that happened. It wasn't a fiery ordeal by any means, but it, it really helped me. Um, uh, uh, put this sort of thing into context. I, I was a guest preacher once at um, Linden Presbyterian Church in the days that Rodney Brits was the minister there. Oh, right. yes. And uh, I remember that morning, I was going to be the preacher, but Rodney was actually going to be there. So he led the service. But it was a very dark and rainy morning. Uh, and I drove through from, I think it was Edenvale, um, and, uh, and, and in the pouring rain, um, and got to the service and ran, you know, from the car to get into the church without getting totally soaked. And I sat uh, quite near the front on the left-hand side, uh, and there was an elderly woman sitting next to me. I can't remember what her name was. And uh, at the beginning of the service, Rodney greeted everybody, and then he said, well, won't you just speak to the person sitting next to you and tell them why you're here? Well, mine was a very quick and easy response. I said, well, I'm here because I'm the guest preacher. And I turned to her and she said, well, you know, when I woke up this morning, it was very dark and it was very rainy and it still is. And then I thought to myself, this is what she said. Then I thought to myself, the Lord never let me down on a rainy day. And I thought, okay. And that makes uh, a lot of sense of this verse for me. You know, um, it can be trouble that comes. It can be suffering. It can be a twist in the road, a fork, which you're not expecting. But the Lord never let me down on a rainy day. So I just carry on. And, and George, that was no pressure for you at all, getting up to preach. <laughs> yeah, I had yeah. to pull the sermon together, boy. <laughs> uh, but that story has lived with me over all those years from then until now. And I'm grateful to her for it, for pointing out something so simple, which is so, e so easily slips our mind, because we're fair-weathered friends for the most part. Mm. But George, doesn't that capture the essence of this chapter? Yes. You know, the one thing that, that I love about this particular chapter so much is that Peter isn't saying to these folk who are suffering, um, you have to die with Christ. Uh, Luke T. Johnson, I think it is, uh, says there's no pious uh, martyrdom here where we have to be like Jesus and, and go to the yes. grave. Yes. All, he, all he's asking of us is just to hang in there, yes. just to persevere. And you know, this, this time has been rough for our congregations. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we haven't really been able to offer them anything other than the encouragement just to hang in there. Yes. Um, as best as they can. And, um, and that's really all Peter is saying is, mm -hmm. is hang in there and mm -hmm. love as though your life depended on it. Yes. And um, right, right. it's, it's, uh, <laughs> you know, I think sometimes we want the fireworks and the miracles and, and the yes. profound things. But sometimes that's all it just takes. I think is it Peterson who talks about a long obedience in the same direction. Yes. And it may be out of context in terms of the book but that he wrote. But that's really, sometimes we've just got to slog 
and, and hanging there. You know? Quite right. So he goes on then in, from verse 13 to 16, and I've got the NIV up there. He says, we should rejoice in as much as we participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Mm. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed. For the spirit of glory and God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any kind of a criminal. And then the worst, uh, of course, possible crime of all, even as a meddler. You know? <laughs> um, however, if you suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed. But praise God that you bear that name. And uh, w when I looked at this passage, I thought um, he's providing us comfort for the future and the present. Because he's saying there's glory coming. But he's also saying the spirit of God or the spirit of glory and of God rests on us now, right now. Mm -hmm. That's what happens to those who, you know, who suffer for the right reasons. I think that's so beautiful. And, and uh, um, uh, the one commentator um, links that to the Shekinah, the, the, the sort of the presence of God, the light yes. of God that rests on you. And, and I think that comes back to the love concept earlier mm. that in our suffering if we continue to to love that's the glory of god that's the beauty of god in us is his love and his grace yeah. doesn't that come back to um to frankel's meaning if we're going to suffer it might as well be for a good reason for a good yes. purpose and um and it's so much easier to endure suffering if you're doing it for for a good reason yes then there's to suffer me for for you know if it's meaningless. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah. And I think that's what he's alluding that's to. The key, that's the absolute key. But yes, you mentioned the Shekinah, the, um, the glow, you know, the, the Moses having to put that little veil on his face because people were uh, afraid. So if you suffer, then, um, and, and it is for, for the sake of Christ and for the sake of the gospel, then there is a glow about you. Um, mm. uh, Stephen, apparently, there was a glow about him when he was being stoned to death for his faith. Um, in Acts chapter 6. Well, I'm fascinated. I'm always fascinated by the naughty bits, you know, that get stuck into these um, verses. Now, I love this, even as a meddler. And I looked it up in the Greek, allo trip, allo trip iskopos. It is a fiddling around in thing, business not your own, being a busybody. <laughs> if it's for that reason, then you mustn't think that it, there's any glory attached to suffering. If you've been faffing around in other people's business, then you must accept your suffering as your just dessert. <laughs> I think we have many experts in that field in the church, don't you? <laughs> yeah. In fact, um, the commentator said, I don't know if it's Barclay or who it was, he said, Peter may have invented the word because they can find it nowhere else in, um, right. you know, in antiquity. The, the, the word is, is a comp, compound word where he's put together, uh, looking into someone else's business. Wow. In, in fact, that was Barclay. You're absolutely right. Uh, okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah. What did the early Christians believe about the end times? And how does that compare to what we believe, Gavin? Well, I, I think, I think um, really, you know, the whole anticipation was for Jesus to return. Yes. And um, uh, there was that sense of hang in there until yes. Jesus comes back. And uh, we need to do our best, obviously, to, um, to share the good news, the gospel, mm -hmm. with as many as we can uh, until Jesus uh, returns. Uh, the danger, of course, in that is that all of our focus is is on that moment and not living in the presence. And um, I often hop back to the text, which declares the time of salvation is now. Yes. Where we shouldn't fail to live in the presence, in the present, right. excuse me, uh, at the expense of that fulfillment of, of, of the end times. Yes. And I think sometimes yes. we, we are so obsessed with eternity and what is to come um, that we, we fail to live in the fullness of Ecclesiastes 3, uh, right. to uh, eat, drink, and be merry, so to speak. I'm paraphrasing, excuse my ad-libbing, um, and to find satisfaction in our toil. Yes. Because I think the most effective way of sharing love is to share it in the present mm. and to experience the fullness of life now. And um, so, I mean, for the early church, 
um, of course, there was this vision of, of Christ returning. Um, but for me, uh, that should be our inspiration to live yes. in, form, in the present. I think there's this I, tension between the now and not yet that we should be living in right now. I yeah. think that is probably, to me, a much more palatable version um, than the version I learned as a, as a child and as a teenager. Uh, watching Hal Lindsey, the late great planet Earth, <laughs> and what is that Left Behind series? Oh, yes, absolutely. I can't remember the author now, but it, it was made yeah. into movies, and you know, two yes. men walking up a hill, and then one is taken in the rapture, and the other one's left behind. Uh, I wish we'd all been ready. We used to sing. Um, it, it, it was a frightening thing, um, and and look, I mean, fear can be a motivator but it's not necessarily a motivator for the long term because we, we, we become unafraid in the presence of familiarity. But if we're supposed to live in the here and now as if he can appear as a thief in the night, um, as if he can take us at any time with no regrets, that's a good way of living, isn't it? Absolutely. And, you know, George, I don't know if you remember the, the days when you were courting Sasha and um, you were trying to impress her and uh, you, you knew that uh, she was coming around for a meal and I don't know, maybe you shaved or brushed your hair or something ridiculous <laughs> like that, <laughs> uh, cooked a meal huh? uh, and you went to great trouble with the excitement and the anticipation uh, that she was going to arrive and you did so to build your relationship and to woo yeah. her and to get to know her better. Uh, for me, that's what it's about, um, that you be the best that you can be now, yes. so that uh, when she does arrive, um, you have the most fantastic evening together yes. in eternity, uh, lost in each other's eyes. Yes. I hope I'm not putting pressure on you for what's no. going to happen later on no, tonight. I, <laughs> I think um, it's absolutely and, lovely. And we for me, that's uh, what it's about, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's, that's what... Um, what uh, John writes from Patmos to the Ephesians. You've lost your first love. And what's the antidote? How are you going to come back? Do the things you did at first. So you, you're telling me to do in my relationship with Christ exactly what John is telling the Ephesians to do. You must. That, that's right. Uh, there you go. You know, what, what was good for courting must be good for, for the rest. Um, Gavin, I, I think we probably have time just for one more question. And I, I'm going to take my cue from that Revelation reading. Um, so. How was the early church motivated by the last judgment is the question. Um, and, and I wonder whether the churches in Asia Minor on the west of this crowd, um, to the southwest, um, the eastern side of the Aegean Sea, there was a group of churches in a circular route from Ephesus to Laodicea. Um, and in Revelation 2 and 3, we hear about this. But they get a privilege that you and I and our congregations may never get. And that is they get a first-hand account of how Christ sees them. Mm. Um, you know, and, you know, some of it's not good. Some mm. of it's pretty awful. He mm. tells the truth. After all, he has the, the sword of, of truth in his mouth. That's right. Um, are we motivated by the end time? Does it still make us do good things? Sure. Uh, that's a massive question, George. Um, and, and as you say, sometimes the message is, is hard. And, and to bring it back to um, the analogy of our relationships with, with people nowadays, uh, in order for relationships to mature and to grow, um, sometimes we have to hear difficult truths. Maybe I haven't been listening. Maybe I haven't been taking the rubbish out. Uh, maybe I have been doing something that, that is hurtful. Um, and in order to own those things, um, uh, we, we have to embrace them. We have to hear them. And it hurts. But if we're willing to face up to that truth and to that hurt, um, that's where we grow. That's where we learn to love more fully. And that's where we learn to connect with Christ, with others, with ourselves more deeply. Now, I think the idea of end times, um, you know, I continued studying after I finished my theology degree simply because 
um, I think as ministers, we get so busy and we get lazy. So we don't do our reading. Uh, we don't maybe do the kind of research that we should do. And being Presbyterian, I paid for UNISA courses um, uh, so that uh, I would have to do the reading and the assignments so that I wouldn't waste the money, you know, what we like. Um, and that accountability forced me to continue to read and to study and to learn and to grow. And the end time serves as that kind of accountability. Okay. Um, where we know that unless we continue to see Christ's face, if we continue to seek his heart, we continue to grow in love, um, then there will be a day where there will be accountability for that. And that keeps on, on uh, helping us to move forward. And for me, that's the motivation of the end right. times, as opposed to a, a fear of a sword hanging over our head, perhaps more the shame of standing in front of a loved one and knowing that we haven't loved them as well as we should have. Right. That's a Perhaps great analogy. Me. That really helps me. Um, the fact that, that the end time holds us accountable. It's, it's almost like something we've paid for uh, because we've invested in Christ just as he has invested in us. And now our lives better get into order because at the end of the day, there will be a, a reckoning. Um, so maybe just something to leave at, at the end. Um, I've always loved uh, the analogy that C.S. Lewis has on um, end times. Um, he writes about this in his little book called The Great Divorce. And, um, and I'm sure you know it, but basically, you know, we get on a bus and off we go and, and we turn up in heaven. We don't know it's heaven. But when we get off the bus, you know, it's actually not as great as any, everybody made it out to be. The grass is very hard. When we drink from the water, it's actually not palatable. And, you know, it's a bit cold and so on. But then, you know, we see somebody that we know um, and they're around there and we strike up a conversation. And basically the, the whole of our life comes out uh, of us in a response. If we are generous and if we are uh, loving towards them, you know, the grass becomes softer. Right. The water is the likes of which we've never tasted. Mm. Uh, we want to go further up and further in mm. and heaven is, is home for us. But if there is vanity or if there is envy or selfishness or any of those, you know, terrible things that grip us, uh, we end up not wanting to be there. So we go off again on the bus, climb back on and go back to wherever. Um, and C.S. Lewis says, that's what heaven is like. That's what the last judgment is like. You know, your whole, the content of your life displays itself in finality and that either disposes you towards heaven it becomes home or it makes it a very alien place and you don't want to be there and that that i guess is, is what hell is we don't want to be there um, but i love it i think that's that a great that, analogy i think that's lovely because it rests within ourselves yeah it's not that god is so much rejecting us but almost we're rejecting that that offer of love and yeah. and grace and yeah, yeah i love that i think that's beautiful Gavin, thank you so very much for a conversation. I've had a wonderful time uh, recording with you this afternoon and it's been an interesting portion of scripture. And as always, um, when I read it at first, I thought, oh, it's a bit daunting. Uh, but now I feel like I can go and preach on it because there's so many things that have come up and interesting things to talk about. So thank you for doing that for us. Absolute privilege, George, and just as enlightening for me. So thank you so much for the opportunity.